Okay, folks, while we are, um, people are still coming in, I'm going to go ahead and get started because we have a lot to cover tonight. Um, and you know, as always, I'm hopeful of getting you out of here on time. So I will just say uh, a gracious good evening to all of you. Uh, by now, you probably know I'm Guy Moody, and I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to our final session on the study of the color of law. Thank you all for your diligence in staying with us over the course of this important study of de jure segregation and its terrible consequences. I'm going to dispense with introductions tonight because we have so much to trouble to, to cover. Um, you've heard the na names before, uh, so I'll just add one great big thank you to all of those who made this event happen. Um, and I don't see uh, Kenny in the queue, so uh, Annette, if you could pull up the litany, we will say the litany together. Uh, I would just ask that those of you um, uh, other than Annette and me uh, to read responsively, but do so with your mics off. Yeah, I'll share a screen, just a moment. Our dismantling racism litany. I will see racism with spiritual eyes because that is how God sees me. I will listen with spirit-filled ears. Because that is how God hears me. I will speak words of truth and reconciliation. Because that is how God speaks to me. I will do what I can to dismantle racism. Because that is what God wants for his people. In this struggle, I will run and not be weary. In this struggle, I will walk and never faint. We can do faint all things, all things through, through Christ, Christ who, strengthens who strengthens us. us. Thank you so much, Annette. And I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce uh, our guest speaker tonight. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the final session of the Presbytery of Baltimore's One Book, One Presbytery Reading of the Color of Law. Tonight, our speaker, our lead discussant, is Reverend McKenna Llewellyn. McKenna is the pastor of the Maryland Presbyterian Church, an LGBT-led and welcoming congregation in Towson, Maryland. Most recently, McKenna was the assistant director of the center, a mission out of the box, hosting youth and others from around the country to hands-on experience with community engagement, personal spiritual growth and evangelism. McKenna is passionate about spreading the love of Christ to everyone she encounters and being an agent of change and good trouble. Tonight, she will lead us in exploring our personal and collective next steps on this journey. McKenna. Thank you, Annette. Um, first, thank yous. Um, thank you to the Dismantling Racism team for inviting me and trusting me with some time um, to In The Loop for also co-sponsoring this um, and to Frank, who is working double time today um, to work out the, the way that we are asking uh, to do breakout rooms. So everybody um, thank Frank. Um, so here is our docket for tonight. First, we're going to talk about segregation. We want to make sure that at the end of the day, you have this take home that you will carry with you, that the government enacted and enforced segregation on purpose, and that institutions, organizations, individual people bolstered it. The government who enacted segregation on purpose can pay reparations and enact them to address those historical harms, 
Um, and as one of the institutions that bolstered all of this segregation policy, the church can support reparations, but the church is called also to work of reparative justice. So that is where we're headed tonight. Everybody take a breath. First, and I'll say it again, segregation was on purpose. If there is one thing that I hope you will carry with you from six weeks in this book, it is that truth. Before I got to Maryland Presbyterian Church, I worked with many of you through the center's programs. We did it imperfectly and persistently and insistently. On Sunday afternoons, we would take people who uh, were serving alongside of one of your churches on driving and walking tours of a city or a suburb. At the end of that drive on the tour through Baltimore City, we closed by walking onto York Road out of the neighborhood Guilford onto Northway. I would ask the folks with me to walk quietly and prayerfully out of Guilford and notice what they saw, what they smelled, what they heard, what they felt. The noise pollution, the smell of gas, the cars flying down York Road struck us as we left the old tree canopy and soft bird song. And the longer we stood there, the more they noticed. There's a stone wall that once held a gate that stands at the neighborhood dividing line. The street we walked was one way out of Guilford for cars, meaning that white neighbors could drive out of the neighborhood, but that black neighbors who were driving off of York Road couldn't enter. The asphalt was darker on the street that was newly painted on the white side of the stone wall. There was something about that street corner in particular that was a good teacher of that fundamental truth that segregation was on purpose because street signs don't grow out of the don't grow out of the ground and point a particular way traffic doesn't calm in particular ways on its own edicts about investment don't fall from the sky no one tripped on their shoelaces and accidentally inverted an integration map in the 1930s and instituted redlining instead the government at every level created it, private citizens, businesses, schools, HOAs, institutions driven by white fear and white rage have helped uphold it. A thousand decisions, big and small, decisions during Hulk mapping process, block busting by racist realtors, public health initiatives that labeled certain races as being disease carriers, racial covenants, transit systems, policing strategies, private security patrols, traffic calming, infrastructure repair priorities. All of that had led to this chasm between Guilford, a neighborhood originally meant to be the second homes for wealthy white families, and Wilson Park, a middle-class neighborhood originally built for black families in the 1950s. Breathe. <sighs> Repair. In the reading for tonight, at the end of his book, Rothstein offers some solutions to move forward toward reparation. And with almost every single one of them, you will have noticed, he admits that there is not political will. He also notes importantly that reparations are not neat, they are not easy, they are not win-win situations for white people. Repairing harm is expensive, messy, sacrificial, and will take more work to undo the harm than it took to institute it. There are movements and people within institutions working toward reparations for these historical harms. The church can join those movements. Actually, I insist, please join one instead of starting another one. Last week, we heard about what organizers are doing to push Maryland toward more just zoning and the undoing of segregation policy. That's just one way you can jump in. But we are the church, we are not the government. We can't direct or pay reparations but we can seek reparative justice. Reparative justice addresses the racial wealth gap caused by segregation and white supremacist policy. It is not ethereal or floating off somewhere, an ideal, it is real and involves real things like money and assets. Repair surrenders resources and money and it seeks reconciliation and relationship. The harm was of the body and the spirit. The repair is of the body and the spirit. We've all been swimming in the waters of white supremacy for a long time, and so when it's time to actually enact repair, white churches specifically really struggle. And so I want to talk particularly to set our conversation up 
not about the decisions to explicitly uphold white supremacy that haunt so many of our churches, and there are plenty of those stories, but about the times that churches have come up to that point, have come up to the place where they might do something to enact repair, and then turn around and don't. A white church ran a summer camp for children in a black neighborhood. After two years, church leaders suggested they pull out of the neighborhood because the children's behavior was not improving despite having what they thought was a good example of moral behavior from the white church members. A black immigrant man sat down in a mostly white church and a regular attendee saw something in his pocket. She assumed it was a gun and called police during worship. When the police arrived and detained him, they emptied his pockets and found not a gun, but a Bible. A white church was looking for community volunteers to help with their food ministry in rural Maryland, but when offered a connection with a youth group with some black youth in it, they declined their help because they didn't want unruly kids coming. A church refused to integrate with its neighbors because their neighbors were not white and might bring expectations of different music or language or too many hugs in worship. A white church listed a worship service as mission in their budget instead of as worship, even though the unhoused and mostly black people there are more regular attendees than the white people who attend on Sunday morning. Because the black and unhoused member people, um, people were um, recipients of ministry and could not pledge money to the church. They were never asked to be members and stayed under the auspices of mission instead of membership and worship. A suburban session asked for help identifying a community in the city where they could send money and volunteers. And when someone pointed out that the new census data indicated that there was high unemployment and lower median income numbers near a black church they could partner with three minutes away, they concluded the census data must be wrong. There was no poverty in their community. They had moved out there to stay away from it. Some of this language, some of these stories sound like they're straight out of the 1970s, but most of you know that they are not. All of these have happened in the last five years in our presbytery. Big, small, medium, wealthy or not, urban, rural, suburban, progressive, moderate, or conservative, white churches have struggled and have a lot of work to do to get our houses in order. In our congregation, on our sessions, in our mission committees, and in the wider presbytery. The good news is that the start of repair is Presbyterianism 101. When we mess it up and enact harm, we confess the truth. We receive the promise of grace and we try again. And with God's help, we do better. We reach out toward peace and repair. Breathe. Your discussion time tonight is ample, I hope, with these stories in the back of your head and ones that are surely in your own mind. I hope that you will first have a chance to be honest about your own action and the ways it fell short or your full inaction. To think about the times you came to the point of repair and turned around and could not do it. When you were an ally instead of someone standing in solidarity, someone making good trouble. And then you'll have time after you come back into this room to consider the work of reparative justice more broadly in your church, on your session, on your mission committee, in worship in many ways, and in your presbytery context. We're breaking these into two separate groups. Then we'll come back together at the end to have a word from Dismantling Racism team leaders about next steps. One of the hardest parts of learning about our own history is learning, excuse me, <coughs> is the feeling of overwhelm. Whether that overwhelm comes from a sense of the hurt that we have incurred historically or the hurt that we have inflicted, that overwhelm can be so much that it stops us from acting one way or another. And so tonight we move toward action. We confess, we know grace is here, we reach out towards something different in that true Presbyterian way. Amen. Amen. Take a breath. I'll turn it back to Guy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, McKenna. 
So um, we are going to do things a little bit differently here um, before we so before we break out for discussion, uh, McKenna kind of gave you uh, a little snapshot of how things are going to be different. Um, uh, first, a reminder that if you suddenly get moved from one group to another, uh, it's because Frank is trying to even out the groups or trying to, to make things uh, homogeneous, and I'll explain in a moment. Uh, so we ask your patience and understanding if this happens to you. Um, but I will go over the, um, the ground rules a little bit. Um, uh, the ones that really are most important, what's said in the group stays in the group. Listen carefully and with respect, allowing others to talk be before you speak again. And so that everyone who wants to speak can be heard, try to make your points as succinctly as possible, no more than two or three minutes a at a time. Then as I, I say, wait to speak um, until everyone's had a chance. Now, our rule of thumb has been so far that if someone isn't comfortable speaking, we will respect that. However, we really hope tonight that all will feel comfortable enough to provide answers to tonight's questions. These questions are at the heart of what it takes to move us towards the justice God desires for all of us. There are no right or wrong answers here. Please, I know that sounds cliche, but believe me, there are none. There are only honest answers tonight. This work is hard, this work is a struggle, and we need to be honest and we need to be forthright if we're ever going to get to where we need to get. I remind you to speak for yourself only using only I statements. Remember that ouch oops principle, listen openly and listen with respect. Uh, and uh, you know, if somebody, you feel you've been harmed, name it. Um, and, and please listen to that person who has been harmed. Um, as we've been saying, make yourself visible on the screen, if at all possible, during your breakout session. If your video isn't working or if you have a good reason for not being visible, like poor McKenna was uh, sick a couple of weeks. Um, thank goodness she's well now. Um, she, that, that kind of thing, sometimes you may not be able to be visible. Um, and as McKenna said, we're going to, be, going to be breaking out not just once, but twice. First for personal reflection and then for corporate reflection. So with that, we're going to do things a little differently. Um, in many of our trainings, we offer people of color a space for themselves only and white people a space for themselves only. Sometimes, frankly, people are more relaxed and comfortable speaking with people of their own race. Um, we're trying to provide as safe a place as possible for you tonight, especially for this first breakout session, uh, so that you will speak honestly and openly as you answer these questions. So for the first breakout session, if you are a person of color, we ask that when Frank puts you into a room that you not accept the uh, assignment into that breakout room. Um, that way you will stay in the main room and then Frank will, will assign you to one or possibly two of the, uh, we have two groups that we've set up uh, with um, leaders who are people of color, uh, both the leader and the scribe. So you will be in one of those two groups. For the second breakout session, because now, you know, it's not so personal. Now we'll be talking about, you know, our church, our, our corporate body of, of churches. So, um, Many of us are in integrated churches. And so we're going to, to open that that's going to be open again, like we have been doing for, for people of all, all races. Um, we will, however, in the second session, offer an open room for pe people who are members of the National Capitol or other presbyteries. So you can discuss more specifically what might be done either in your churches or collaborative, collaboratively within your presbyteries. Um, I hope this is making sense. I know this is a lot different, so I'm going to open it up to see if anybody has any questions um, to make sure that you're clear on what we're doing. Okay, I see no questions. So Frank, uh, go ahead and do your magic. <laughs> 